Hey, mixing it up today. At the time of writing this video, Spotify has categorized 5,987 distinct genres of music. That's a number that has bit. almost certainly increased by the time you're watching this now. Unless you can name all nearly 6,000 of them, there's a pretty good chance you're a fan of a genre you haven't even heard of. Perhaps you enjoy gothabilly, neurostep, or black and deathcore. You could be a listener of baps, bebop, or funk. But the fact of the matter is that you don't really need to know exactly what kind of music you like, because Spotify already has you all figured out. Every week, for every user, they're able to tailor a 30-song playlist to that person's exact music tastes, ranging from the world's most popular artists to the most niche indie productions on the platform. Ed Sheeran isn't niche. I think that I would struggle to come up with 30 genres. I know a lot of them are splitting hairs, though. <laughs> I listen to a lot of jazz, and sometimes I check what Spotify has the song categorized under, and I've seen uh, Jazztronica. Acid jazz, prog jazz. Very creative though, I appreciate that. I use Spotify probably every day or every other day, mostly for podcasts, but also as a place to just store the music that I like that I don't wanna download onto the computer and take up space for. But I haven't had much luck with the Spotify tailored playlists that they recommend to me. Out of the 30 songs, maybe I pick one, sometimes not even the one. Let me know if you like the songs that they recommend to you. I definitely have wondered though, what criteria are they using to decipher what type of music they think people will like? So, here we go. But have you ever wondered how? I mean, you probably have because that's why you clicked on this video. So, um, here's how. Spotify's recommendation system is composed of three different algorithms, which makes it three times better than one algorithm because of math. The first of these three actually has nothing to do with the music itself, and it's called collaborative filtering. This is basically the way that Netflix recommends new shows, by writing a 6,000 word a end job. user license agreement that gives them permission to record everything you do until you die or throw your phone into a volcano. Located in Spotify's giant matrix room, pictured here, they've stored a giant matrix. It's roughly 433 million rows by 80 million columns, indexing every single user and every single song on the platform and recording how often each person listens to each song. This is simplifying things a bit, but this matrix allows them to objectively determine which users are most similar. If one row is hitting all the same columns as another row, that means those two people are listening to the same songs. And if one of those rows has an active column that the other doesn't have, then that song would, theoretically, be good to recommend. Basically what I'm saying is, if you want to ruin a specific person's Spotify, all you have to do is make a new account, listen to all their favorite songs, and then listen to Tornado Siren sound effects by Royalty Free Music and Sound Effect Factory 70,000 times. Now, Spotify can't rely entirely on collaborative filtering. It's not very accurate, especially when it comes to people's multifaceted music tastes, and it tends yeah, to just exactly. promote generally popular music while burying things that don't have a ton of listening data to work with, like the Sam from Wendover's Old Time Jamboree Band, even if their music is hot fire. That's where the next algorithm comes in, Spotify's natural language processing system. You see, one of the best ways to categorize songs is with words, and it turns out that the internet has a whole bunch of them. Spotify is constantly gathering text associated with its songs. It'll look at text on its own platform, stuff like song titles, playlist descriptions, and lyrics, but it'll also pull data from the rest of the internet. Spotify scrapes song reviews, news articles, comment sections, you name it, and all this goes into building an associated word bank for each song and artist on its platform. Here's one such table generated by Echo Nest, the music data company that Spotify purchased in 2014 for the phrase ABBA. As you can see, it has the noun phrases most commonly associated with Dancing ABBA, queen, as well as the Mia, adjectives most commonly era. used when describing ABBA. Using this table, you can intuit that ABBA fans will probably like other things that are frequently described with perky, nonviolent, and Swedish, such as Greta Thunberg or this stuffed shark that has its own subreddit for some reason. But at this point, you've probably noticed something weird. All of this data that Spotify is using, the adjectives, the song titles, the listening frequencies, none of it is gathered from the music itself. So that raises the question, can Spotify actually listen to its own music? And the answer, interestingly, is yes. This is where our third algorithm comes in. Spotify's sonic profiles. Sorry, Spotify's sonic profiles. Here's how they work. For each song on the platform, Spotify generates something called a time frequency representation, which looks something like this. This axis is time, this axis is frequency, and warmer colors mean louder decibel levels, so for example, at exactly 12 seconds into this song, these are the frequencies that are most present. 
This representation is then dumped into a neural network where these rectangles make the song smaller, and these rectangles are borderline sentient, and their only purpose in life is to extract semantic data from your ex-boyfriend's mixtape. The neural network isolates all of the Mixed major features tape. of the song, stuff like its key, tempo, timbre, loudness, and time signature, and compares these qualities individually against other songs you like and other songs you haven't heard. Then, in tandem with the collaborative filtering system and natural language processing algorithm, these sonic profiles are used to precisely hone in on songs that are acoustically similar enough to the kind of music you already listen to, while also experimenting with one or two variables to avoid presenting you with anything too stale. And there you go. That's how to spend $11 billion a year convincing people to not just listen to the same three Taylor Swift songs on repeat for the rest of their life. Now, while it might be worth shelling out 10 bucks a month for a robot to tell you what you like, I've got okay, a better value proposition. A lot more goes into that than I considered. This is the type of video I like, just random information. The channel's called Half is Interesting, you'll find it linked down below. And there's a certain nostalgia that comes with the memory of making mixtapes with blank CDs on my Mac for my friends in 2012. Now my computer doesn't even have a CD-ROM drive. That's considered vintage. <laughs> anyway, watching this, I was thinking of how I prefer the music that YouTube recommends to me than the music that Spotify, or to the music that Spotify recommends to me. They just get me a bit better. But even then, I still have to search to find something that I truly enjoy, so the perfect algorithm just doesn't exist. Let me know which one you prefer to find new music, Spotify or YouTube. That goes to show how important an algorithm is to a company, which is why an app like TikTok has users sucked in for hours at a time because that algorithm learns the user. Probably why I don't spend too much time on TikTok. I don't want them to learn me. I'd like Spotify to learn me though. And that made me think of, well, now my brain's on AI, which has my mind on ChatGPT. And it was a subscriber who sent me the link for ChatGPT in what must have been, it seems like a couple of months ago, so late November. And I've been using it nearly every day since. If you haven't, it's this chat job, chat job, <laughs> chat bot that can generate information when prompted questions and in a surprisingly conversational tone everything from can you write me a line of code to copying and pasting a line of code and asking for it to debug that line of code to can you explain the beer fermentation process give me more information about the yeast can you write that into a script can you simplify that and speak to me like i'm five years old can you write that into a paper what are the five most popular beers in Japan? I can just keep going, but it's a very useful tool. I've been using it for not only a supplement to studying, but also summarizing books that I've read. And from November to now, the news about ChatGPT has only been increasing. And I wonder if in the future, we're going to look back at the introduction of ChatGPT to the mainstream as this pivotal moment in the AI revolution. I see a lot of potential positives, a lot of potential negatives. I think that's just going to depend on how individuals decide to use it, which could be said of any new technology. Some people are taking online courses on the internet. Other people are selling illegal substances on the dark web. It just depends, right? But... When I say AI revolution, I don't mean robots taking over and revolting. I don't picture iRobot, if you've ever seen that movie. At least not anytime soon. I just think this opens the door for maybe a heavier reliance on AI. Especially the sort that can generate information as opposed to just analyzing already existing data. And really, it's just one more site, one more app on top of all of the artificial intelligence that we already use every day and have accepted for years. And I see people comparing it to the advent of iPhone 1. And I think maybe that could be true. I wonder if it will represent something similar or if it will trigger a chain of events that eventually represents something similar. And if it's not ChatGPT, it'll be some other software. Wow, I'm really just chatting now. Um, <laughs> if you've used it, let me know why, because there are so many use cases that I haven't considered yet. I think part of the game is getting good at asking it questions. Maybe we can have a whole video just talking about that, but back to music. I think that 
music taste is based so heavily on emotive response rather than a logical one. And after watching this, I think that's probably where the disconnect between Spotify being able to accurately determine my personal music taste and what I do like lies. They have a very good logical algorithm. But I think that music taste is a very illogical realm. But of course, I am only speaking to my own experience. I think it's likely that those Spotify tailored playlists do work for, I'm going to guess, the majority of users because if not, it wouldn't be lucrative for the company or they would probably tweak it or any of the other possibilities get rid of it. So I'll leave your opinion on that. And for a literary recommendation, I don't believe I've read anything on algorithms, certainly nothing about Spotify. And the books I have read from musicians I've already recommended before. So I'm thinking about something that's a bit off. Still a very good book though. It's called The New New Thing by Michael Lewis. It follows a tech entrepreneur in Silicon Valley during the internet revolution. So another revolution of sorts. And I'm realizing that Michael Lewis is a contemporary author that I read quite a bit of. He's also written Moneyball, Liar's Poker, The Big Short. I think he also wrote The Blind Side, which I haven't read, but I know that that became a movie at some point as well. I might be biased because he writes a lot of financial literature and I read a lot about finance, but I think he does a really good job of explaining it in a way that is digestible for people who aren't into that. For example, in The Big Short, a lot of people don't know what mortgage-backed securities are, but he explained it really well. And that's actually where I learned what a mortgage-backed security is. So I'll do that. And then whenever we talk about m music on this channel, I've asked you guys to recommend music to me. And I've liked it probably with more accuracy than the Spotify's recommended playlist. So I'm going to drop some music. I'm going to try to pick music from wildly different genres and feel free to recommend any songs as well. Other than that, I can already see that this video is 40 minutes long off of a five minute spot. So I'll stop now. That's all from me. Leave your thoughts and thanks for watching with me.